Okay, this is the second position that we're going to use to look at isolated pawns. And this is a game again played by Anatoly Karpov with the white pieces again. And this time against a quite young Vladimir Kramnik. Vladimir Kramnik will be known to many as one of the greatest players of today's chess. He's, as of the time of recording, over 2,800 in rating and still an active player. Now, in this position, what can we say? Well, the pawn structure in this case is almost identical. The only difference is that the pawn is on h6. Now, this is not an especially noteworthy difference in and of itself. However, what we see here is the intersection between positional play and dynamic play. Because the white pieces, the rooks are all identical in the position for white rooks and black rooks. The knights on f3 and f6 are also symmetrically placed. However, the bishops, we can see the white bishop is a more powerful piece because of where it's placed on d4. And also we can say the same for the queens. As a consequence of this, black is under pressure. When you have an identical structure, but your opponent has better placed pieces, it's logical that you're going to be the one at risk. And the problem is, you know, let's imagine that black decides to play a move like bishop to e7, just to reinforce the attack on this knight on f6, and white now goes ahead and plays a move like rook to d1. Well, we could see a line such as queen to d5, queen takes queen, knight takes queen, and suddenly bishop takes g7 check. And white would be picking up a pawn and black would suffer quite a lot. And this, by the way, should not be unexpected. It's very typical that tactics favor the side who has played a better strategy. And here something has already gone a little wrong for Vladimir Kramnik. So therefore, in this position after queen takes f5, black chose to play the move queen to c8. And basically accepting that any given moment, white could capture on f6, for instance, exchange the queens, then capture on f6, and this would be a bad pawn structure for black. However, Karpov doesn't immediately do so. He keeps the queens on the board for now. Black goes a6, queen to b6, now queen goes to c7, queen takes c7, bishop takes c7, and now sure enough, bishop takes f6, g takes f6. I presume that Karpov felt that Kramnik would continue to try and seek out the queen exchange, even accepting this pawn structure, but that this was a better version for white with the insertion of the move a6 and also with the bishop ending on c7 instead of d6. Now, whether or not this makes a substantial difference, I'm not so certain. But nevertheless, we get this position. Now, once again, the isolated pawns can be very weak in and of themselves, but the other problem is that right in front of an isolated pawn, you can have potential outposts. So now let's take a look at what Karpov does to use this outpost on f5. He goes rook e1, rook e8, rook d1, and now a couple of rooks get exchanged, rook d8, g3, creating an escape square, rook d7, rook e2, very nice play, defending on f2, which may be a point that gets attacked, and also defending a2 and b2. And of course, it was important to have first played g3 so that there is no funny business with rook d1 check. Now, after king to g7, white now plays knight to h4. The knight is free to try and navigate to the f5 outpost because the rook on e2 does a good job of preventing any sort of rook d2 move. Rook goes to d5, stopping access to the f5 square. Rook e7, rook to c5, defending the bishop. Rook to d7, well, actually, this one is very important, b4. Now, the rook was ideally placed on c5 because it covered f5 and it defended the bishop. After b4, the rook must leave. Knight jumps into f5 with check, king g6, kicking the knight out. Knight reroutes to e3. Rook c1, king g2, bishop e5, 
rook a7, rook c6, knight to d5. For now, it seems as though this square is under control, but let's see what happened. Bishop goes to d6 to prevent knight e7. a3, king f5, knight e3 check, king g6, and now king f3. The king improves itself a little bit further. Still, Karpov has his eye on that f5 square. Bishop e5, knight d5 again, threatening the same knight e7 fork, so king goes to g7. Now, knight e7 anyway, rook moves with check, and believe it or not, the pawn is going to get captured on a3, and black will actually be a pawn to the good for now. King g4, rook takes a3, f4, kicking the bishop from a very nice post on e5, bishop goes to c3, and now an amazing idea, king to h5. The idea by Karpov is bishop takes b4, knight f5 check, Karpov will be down two pawns, but he has finally been able to stabilize his knight on f5, and the combination of his rook, knight, and king can weave deadly threats against the black monarch. Now here black drops his king back to g8. Karpov actually in the game gave a check on a8 and then dropped the rook back and eventually he played this move knight takes h6 so we'll skip the repetition part. King goes to f8 and now rook takes f7 check, king goes to e8 and king goes to g6. And this in fact is a position that is I suspect winning for white. I'm not sure, I haven't checked with the most powerful engine in the world, so I don't want to say something that is wrong, but certainly black is struggling a lot here. If he's not completely busted, he's very close to it, and in fact in the game he lost in a very instructive manner. Bishop went to c3 to defend the pawn on f6, knight to f5, very nice idea, the knight from f5 defends g3, which allows the h-pawn to move up the board, but also very importantly the bishop on c3 is unable to cover the promotion square for white because of the pawn on f6. Now, black pushes to b4, white steps his rook onto b7, rook a2, h4, a5, h5, we have that race, but we see white is very much in the lead. a4, h6, rook to h2, h7, the problem is that white may, in some situations, drop the knight to either h4 or h6, which would enable this threat, very, very strong threat, just winning a queen, and alternatively also rook b8 in some situations, and then h8. Black went king to d8, sure enough white went knight h4, and now black plays this move f5, which covers the h8 square, but Karpov has a very important point. Rook takes b4. The bishop is overloaded on c3. It can't both take the rook and cover h8. Rook goes to h3 instead. Rook takes a4. Both of the black pawns have fallen. Rook takes g3 check. King takes f5. This is quite an easy win because at the very least white will promote the pawn. Then after bishop takes pawn, rook a8 check and it'll be rook knight and pawn against king and rook, and that is just a very trivial win at this level. So black resigned. Now, what is incredibly instructive about this example is the way that it all begun with a position like this, where the structure was identical, but the peace pressure led to black seeking to exchange queens, even at the expense of damaging his pawn structure. And then we saw that with isolated pawns, you have two problems. Number one, the pawns themselves cannot be defended so easily, so they make for easy targets. And number two, the fact that they are isolated just means that there are no pawns on either file next to them, which means, therefore, that the squares in front of them, especially the square directly in front of them, in this, in this case, the f5 square, is going to make for a very beautiful outpost, potentially. And so Karpov 
goes ahead and gets the absolute max out of that f5 square. He first kicks the rook out so that he can step onto that square. Of course, Kramnik, a class act, makes him really work very hard, and he has to, in the end, use some tactics, Karpov, in order to, and even concede a couple of pawns temporarily, in order to finally gain access to f5. But notice that once he does this, he gets his king, he activates his king, brings the knight onto f5, and the threats are so strong against the black king. We notice that here, for example, black would be unable to play king to f8, because rook a8, the rook and the knight combine very nicely against the black king. So he was forced to play king to g8. And now after knight takes h6 check, king goes to f8. We've seen actually, I should have mentioned this, the h pawn itself becomes an isolated pawn once you play g takes f6 as well. So in fact, it's really two double pawns here and an isolated pawn on h6 to boot, right? So it's really a disaster the structural change, knight takes h6 check, the first pawn falls, king f8, rook takes f7, the second pawn falls, and a few moves later, we get the following position, rook takes b4, rook takes a4, these pawns, of course, falling because of the presence of the pawn on h7, which is a nice relationship between these pawns on the queen and the king side, and after rook takes g3, finally, the last of the isolated pawns falls, king takes f5, and fittingly, black resigns. So I hope that you enjoyed these two examples on doubled and isolated pawns. And the next thing that we're going to be talking about is mobility of pawns. So let's get to it.